Good day, brothers and sisters. The other Paul is here, and we are now live for my debate review of the William Albrecht versus Theosophical Wanderings debate on whether Sola Scriptura is biblical. So, not whether it's true, it's a distinct proposition, although, of course, with the Christian faith, it's basically a virtual distinction only, but Otherwise, it's still a distinct proposition, and that's going to be important for how this debate plays out. Um, even up to this last moment, I kind of de I kind of debated with myself whether I wanted to play through the opening statements, or if I just kind of wanted to summarize them, give my own thoughts, and then play through the rebuttals on the screen. I'm, I mean, they're not they're not that long; they're like fifteen minutes each, and as long as long as if I don't pause too much. Um, then it won't blow this out to like a three hour giga stream. But the issue is then if I don't comment that much, then I might, um, what should we call it? Then it, it might just be like a glorified replay of the debate, you know? Um, so hopefully what I'm, what I'm hoping for is that people watching have watched the debate already so that I don't have to necessarily do that. Um, but I may, I'm, yeah, at, at minimum, I may still, play some bits maybe i'm still kind of debating that i guess i'll just uh mull over that in my head while i say hi to people we've got sky apologetics good to see you reverend marcus williams no comment <laughs> steve-o we'll be listening to this while i'm outside raking the leaves uh be sure to mention that tarotin fan is also making a debate review well there you go that's just happened and i made one already yes you did mm, excuse me looking forward to this many thank you many thanks Matt Schneider, Jay says that reading the church fathers and trying to understand what they mean is a form of soul scriptura. I mentioned this on Twitter and one of his fans affirmed this. I, I think I remember that. And that's just, it's all so tiresome. It's all so tiresome. Good day, other bowl. Good day, Jay Athanasius. How are you? Um, speaking of which, if any of the, if any of the lads, um, if any of the lads, whether they're YouTube boys or trusted guys whom I've talked with. If any of you have seen this debate and you have some thoughts to contribute, hit me up and I can send you the link. Andrew Bailey, one of my OG boys. How are you, man? Good to see you. And I hope you're going well as well. What do you call your robot bishop again? <laughs> this is good old fashioned dogma bot. It gives me infallible certainty on every single thing I believe. It's, it's better than Rome. It's better than the East combined times 10 by a factor of four. So, yeah, it's uh, nothing, nothing, nothing can beat it. I just ask it anything I want, and it gives me direct divine revelation. And as long as I snort up the phronema that it also dispenses, it, it gets directly implanted into my brain. I don't have to interpret it at all. It's just it's it's great that way. It's a uh, it's exactly what uh, Christ actually established. <clears throat> Sorry, a bit of a nose issue right now. Um, but oh my word, <laughs> I just. Steve, oh, why? <laughs> That's kind of funny. That's kind of funny. I submit to the Diocese of Discord. So true. So true. Dogma Bot. Awesome. I wish I had one. It's a exclusive production, this one. Anywho, um, ah, do I want to play through the openings or do I want to? Ah, ah okay, fine. You know, what? I'm going to, okay, I'm going to play the openings, but I have seen them. And so what I'll do um is just is i'll largely I'll, I'll listen to them i'll comment on them but i may also skip through portions um because i have seen it just to get to more relevant bits to comment on so it doesn't take too long so i'm gonna open up the tab and there we go okay and oh actually you know what before we do that i need to give a legendary thanks to my Local supporters, you absolute legends, you help me keep doing this. Um, you 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 help me make this into a regular thing. Um, and with your support, more excellent material is underway, is under the works as we speak. Um, and I am ramping it up once again after months of like there being not a whole ton, especially in the pre-recorded video department. So many thanks to you, legends. And uh, by the way, I, that's that's what I forgot to mention. Um, it'll be tomorrow circa for whoever's available 
circa, I think. Actually, no, sorry, the day, sorry, the day after. So Sydney time, Monday, the 13th at circa, yes, at 10 a.m. That will be a private stream for you legendary supporters. Um, so get hyped for that if you're a supporter and become a supporter right now if you would like to partake in that and to help me keep producing epic stuff for the channel at a greater quantity and a greater quality. So many thanks for that as and also for priority in Q&As. With that said, um, let us return to the debate window here. So I'll listen to, I'll, I'll let this play, I'll comment when I want, um, and I'll skip through bits when I know that there's not a whole ton to comment on, and just, just to make sure this all goes faster. So let us commence with the opening by Theosophical Wanderings. Um, but actually, to give my summary of the debate, just as a just as a preface, as my overall framing, um, Theo here he kept to the point. He kept the topic. All Brecht, he he didn't do as he wasn't as bad as a number of people say, in my opinion, from my side. But he did do the fairly typical dun, 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 jumping around the the topic. Um, yeah, and you guys will see this. You you guys will see this. Uh, when we get to Albrecht's opening, particularly towards the uh, towards the end, so uh, let's listen to Theo's opening, and I will comment on it as we go. And I start your time as soon as you begin to speak. And if the volume is bad, then do tell me. Okay, let's go. We good? We are good to go. All right. Thank you, Marlon and William, for hosting this debate. Uh, so let's get right into it. Um, how many times have you heard the claim sola scriptura is not in the Bible? Protestants are in a dilemma. I've heard this plenty of times, and I'm sure you have too. And I'm here today to challenge this often repeated claim. The topic for the debate today is whether sola scriptura is biblical. I take the affirmative, William takes the negative. So let me make my case for why I think sola scriptura is biblical. First, some housekeeping. When I say that sola scriptura is biblical, let me explain what I do not mean. I do not mean that there is an explicit passage that says sola scriptura. Nor do I mean that sola scriptura has been the norm at every point throughout history. So let me tell you what I do mean. First, Some definitions by sola scriptura i mean i was the scriptures muted the, the whole freaking time once again fantastic okay tldr it is good um that he made the qualification right at the start that <laughs> my gosh unbelievable i'm not gonna get not gonna get distracted adhd intrusive thoughts not gonna get distracted it's good that he made the qualification right at the start there that sola scriptura was not a truly uh, properly speaking principled norm throughout all time um it's something that is historically contingent that is good that is a necessary nuance to make very few people make it um and when people don't make it that's when you get the whole mess of oh my solo scriptura is not in the bible uh, but but how do you explain hold to my traditions whether delivered by word or by or by letter that just nullifies all those proof texts and yet yeah, unfortunately um Albrecht does go for that, as you will see with his opening statement. But yes, so there's a good nuance. Glad he made it. Um, that really helps, like, actually define the case very well. Authority in the church. In other words, the scriptures are the thing everything else is measured against, but are not themselves measured by anything else. They are the final authority. And they are the sole authority in the sense that there is no other authority in the church given by God that is final like the scriptures are. So what do I mean by biblical? I mean, when something is either explicitly contained within the Bible or can be rightly inferred from the Bible. Notice, I gave two options here for how something can be biblical. It can either be explicit or it can be inferred. So when I say that Sola Scriptura is biblical, I am taking the second option. I'm saying that it can be rightly inferred. So a case of either explicit or by good and necessary consequence. Again, a great and necessary nuance. From the biblical data. 
Now, someone might object to this move and assert that the only way Sola Scriptura can be biblical is if I can find an explicit verse that mentions it. But this is false. We infer lots of things from the Bible that are not explicit, the Trinity being the prime example. Nowhere does the word Trinity appear explicitly in the Bible, yet we still think that the Trinity is biblical. This is because we do not need an explicit passage that says Trinity. We can infer the Trinity from the preponderance of the biblical data because we see all the members of the Trinity in Scripture. So we do not need for something to be explicit in the Bible in order to say that it is biblical. We can okay, so not 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 quite a mistake, but I think a bit of a, a little bit of a tactical oversight and one that could have been done with an absolutely beautiful like a beautiful retort to it just in the opening yeah it, it, he's functionally replying to the where does jesus say i am trinity worship me argument um and and that's that's basically what it is and it's a good reply but in the roman apologetics world there are a decent number of them who will actually uh who will actually not grant that hey we agree that the trinity is biblical just even if it's not explicitly stated in as many words you will get none of them you you will get some of them and i haven't counted them who who won't even say you have all the necessary components of the Trinity in Holy Scripture. Uh, and that's why you literally needed the Council of Nicaea, not merely to enforce unity in a practical sense, but to actually supply the missing information, whether it's Nicaea or quote-unquote sacred tradition, because there's actually information missing in the Holy Scriptures. It's not just that it was not assembled. Um, so it would have been good for the sake of completeness if he briefly mentioned them at the end of this moment, and then he could have given the beautiful retort. Well, all the night, literally all the nice, you're 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 fighting against literally all the Nicene fathers who strove to prove the Holy Trinity from Scripture, even without referencing the Nicene Council. So cry harder. If he did that, beautiful. But yeah, otherwise, that's why I don't say it's like a mistake per se, because in the end, all Brecht does agree. Um, but there just may be such people in the audience who are like, oh no, the Trinity's not in the Bible. You need my church. So yeah. anyway, anyway. You can infer it. So I think that Sola Scriptura is biblical. I have two main arguments in which I will make my case. The first being what I call the bird's eye view of scripture. This refers to what we see in scripture as a whole from beginning to end. Notice that my definition of Sola Scriptura is that the scriptures are the sole final authority in the church. Okay, so why should we think this is biblical? Well, from a bird's eye view, all throughout the Bible, we see repeated over and over this idea that what God says has final authority. Let me repeat that. All throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we see this idea that what God says has the final authority. We also see in the Bible that the scriptures are what God says to the church. And the men of the hour is in the chat. Good to see you, mate. So we have these two facts that we see in the Bible, and this is where we make our inference. So if nothing else we possess today contains what God says to the church besides the scriptures, then we can infer that the scriptures are the sole final authority for the church today. Simply put, the word of God has always had the final authority. And if the scriptures are the only thing we have today that contains the word of God, then that's our final authority. Here's all this laid out in a syllogism. One, from the scriptures, we see that what God says to the church has final authority. Two, the scriptures are what God says to the church. Three, if what God says to the church has final authority and the scriptures are what God says to the church, then provided that nothing else we possess today contains what God says to the church besides the scriptures, then the scriptures are the sole final authority in the church. Four, nothing else we possess today contains what God says to the church besides the scriptures. Five, therefore, the scriptures are the sole final authority in the church. So I think William and I will be in agreement with the first three premises. I think where he will disagree is with premise four. Nothing else we possess today contains what God says to the church besides the scriptures. So how do I defend this premise? Well, there are two steps to this and both are abductive. The first step is to argue that God does not speak to the church today. And by this, I mean in the sense that God does not give the church new public revelation. As most Christians agree, God spoke through the apostles and the apostolic period was the final period that God gave divine public revelation. And this so drawing back to something he said a little bit earlier where he said nothing else contains the word of god i know what he's going for but there is some necessary precision to be made with there um you will see with the reformation for example they will speak of non-biblical 
texts and authors and preachers even as like they have the word of God. Like you'll you sometimes you can even hear Lutherans say the book of Con- Concord is the word of God. Not not because God himself dropped the book of Concord in their lap, um, but because it is the authentic um the authentic confessional expression of Holy Scripture. And thus it is in content the word of God. Um he, you know he does thankfully he does somewhat make that distinction when he at this bit here where he says that um, God doesn't speak to the church today in the sense of new public revelation. So that's more specific, and that's correct. Um, Nonetheless, that is still a necessary nuance to make, and and it's an important one because you will get the arguments like Albrecht will bring up in his opening um, about, oh, look, there's oral sources as well. Now, again, thankfully, uh, Theo as well will recognize, yes, there's oral revelation too, hence his whole qualification that Sol Scriptura isn't the case for all time. Um, but thankfully, uh, even better, he kind of wraps it all up together somewhat well with his Mark chapter seven, uh, use, but anyway, I'll let, I'll let him get to that. This period ceased after the death of the last apostle. Thus, God is no longer speaking to the church via public revelation. And we have biblical evidence to back this up. Hebrews one, one says in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. Notice the past tense here of has spoken which makes sense because Christ was the consummate fulfillment of everything foreshadowed in the Old Testament and was ultimately what it all pointed to. Therefore, his fulfillment was final and sufficient. And then we also have Jude 1.3, which refers to the faith once for all delivered. Now, you, true as that is, you can also get the good, you can also get the reply where Christ does speak to the apostles. There's much more I have to tell you but I, but I can't. I'm going to send the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit, to, um, uh, to to reveal all these other things to you from the Father. Uh, and, and then, of course, that's where a Romanist or an Eastern will argue. Oh, look! Therefore, from the apostles, this came to the church. So, therefore, the church is protected. Obviously, that doesn't follow. Um, but in any case, um, that's that's a bit that's a bit of a nuance that he that he kind of missed with with uh, with that one. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a be- there's a better way to put that one for his purposes. It kind it kind of works, but it's there, there is a bit of a better way to put it. Um, but so far, on the whole, he's making a very solid and precise case. Notice it says once for all delivered, not continually being delivered. So God speaking to the church through public divine revelation is confined to the apostolic period, and that period is now over. So I think that the only thing we possess today that contains what God says to the church are the scriptures. This is where the second step of my argument comes in. Remember, God last spoke to us through the apostles, but it has been 2,000 years since the apostles were alive. Not a lot survives in that amount of time. Sure, when they were alive, the apostles gave inspired oral teachings and inspired written teachings, the latter of which we find in the scriptures. But between their oral and written teachings, I would argue that it's more likely that the only thing we have left today are their written teachings, because there's just no reliable way we can preserve, much less know what their oral teachings are after 2,000 years. That would be very unlikely. Now, great point, great nuance that must be made. Um, Because again, he recognizes, yes, they're oral teachings, they gave oral teachings, granted, and those are authoritative, but where are they? Like, how, how do we verify what they are? Now, once again, yeah, <laughs> most of my criticisms of, of Theo here, <laughs> I, 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 most of them are just like little bits of nuance and nitpick, um, which is uh, which should be a compliment to him. But I guess in, in any case, um, do we have the oral teaching of the apostles? Did, did that preserve? Was that preserved even up to this day? Yes, it, it was. Because... Um, it's this because with respect to content, it always was the faith always was even alongside scripture, but nonetheless, it always was um, taught orally received and then taught again, orally generation to generation down the line. So in that sense, yes, we do. Um, <clears throat> that's why the distinction must be made between modes of transmission versus modes of verification in terms of transmission. Yes. The faith has always been since the beginning transmitted both by word of mouth and by the letter. The question at hand, however, with the debates on theological authority is regards to modes of verification. So what sources uh, have the principal place of authority 
and trustworthiness such that we can test a given claimant to apostolic teaching against it. And it is against that standard that the claim rises or falls. That's the precise question. Um, and so further with that nuance, he should have said that we don't, we do. So in that sense, um, so in that sense, we do possess the apostolic teaching orally, but we know this with certainty because we have their verbatim written words against which we can check that. That's what he should have said. But also he should so how he should have said this is that we don't possess the oral apostolic teaching in the sense of their verbatim words. So we do have that with the written text. We, we do. And now, of course, it was funny because in my debate with him, Jimmy Aiken, he said, oh, but there's text criticism and there's disagreements on what they said in this passage or that. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get a good opportunity to respond to that. But the answer is quite obvious. Like the vast, vast, vast majority of the New Testament, there's like either no variant or there's no meaningful variant. Um, yeah, sure. Okay. Oh, no. Word order has changed here or spelling has changed here. But there's no change in the meaning at all. And so functionally, yes, we do still have the verbatim words of the apostles, whether it's this option or that, and there's no change in meaning. So we still have that certainty. And with those passages where there are um, uh, where there are variants that do change the meaning in a significant way, okay, granted. And yet we do have, for the vast majority of them, great textual testimony to give us moral certainty that this is the authentic words, and these aren't. Now, there's even fewer cases, like you probably like less than a handful, where there is genuine ambiguity, like the pericope adulterate. And in those cases, I totally grant, yeah, I don't go to those as a primary proof text precisely because of their uncertainty. That's a consistency of principle. Um, but in any case, to, to, to bring it back, rega regardless of all that, that's what John should have said, in my opinion, that we do we do possess the verbatim written words of the apostles, which are the very which are the very words that were inspired. We don't possess the verbatim words of the the verbatim oral words of the apostles that were never written down. Um, they were only transmitted by rearticulations of their successes, which yes, they can be accurate, and we can check history along with the scriptures. And for the most part, in most circumstances, they were accurate, but sometimes they weren't. That's that's the point because these are rearticulations by successes. They didn't um, for the vast majority of the part of the of the case, they didn't claim. Um, like in a Muslim Isna chain where um, uh, Bishop so-and-so said that Presbyter so-and-so said that the Apostle Peter said, quote. Now, if we had that, that would be freaking amazing. Um, and even just like intuitively, it is, it's, it's actually not very difficult in oral cultures to pass on verbatim oral statements that that has happened historically. Um, but we just didn't have that for, for the early church, unfortunately, with the Apostles. And so everything we know of all the oral transmission of the faith came down through rearticulations of later presbyters, bishops, and what have you, restating what they have received, whether orally or from the scriptures in their own words, which can err and can misrepresent the apostles in principle. That's the nuance he should have put on it. Um, otherwise, he did get that substantial point, which is good, but he should have put that nuance on it. Um, that would allow him to cut off many other avenues for attack, which which Albrecht will attempt to go for. So these are my two steps to support premise four. In summary, these two steps make a good abductive case that nothing we possess today contains what God says to the church besides the scriptures. If my opponent disagrees with this, then he bears the burden of proving that he has an actual inspired apostolic tradition not found in scripture. And if he cannot do this, then we have no reason to believe that anything besides the scriptures contain what God says to the church and thus my argument goes through. Now I want to briefly point you to something I just mentioned here. Notice, I said that both the oral and the written teaching of the apostles were inspired. I'm pointing this out to preempt my opponent in raising an issue between the oral right. teaching of the apostles and sola scriptura. But there is simply no issue between these two because the oral and written teaching of the apostles make up the same body of revelation. Plus, as I've argued, it's more likely than not that the inspired oral teaching of the apostles eventually found its way into the written teaching of scripture, at least as far as what remains today. Thus, there is no issue here for sola scriptura. Now let's move on to the second part of my argument to show that sola scriptura is biblical. This is what I call my zoom lens view because it focuses in on a specific biblical passage 
that makes better sense if sola scriptura were true. And that passage is Mark 7, 13, in which Jesus rebukes the Pharisees for their traditions, saying, thus you nullify the word of God by your traditions that you handed down. Here we see a principle from Jesus that is as follows. God's word should never be nullified by human interpretive tradition. Nobody, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, or Protestant would reject this principle. All of us would affirm that God's word should not be nullified by human tradition. So we have to ask, which hypothesis best predicts such a principle? Is it the sola scriptura hypothesis, or is it some sort of infallible church hypothesis like Catholics and Eastern Orthodox hold? Now, I suspect with the way he's saying it, it sounds like a bit of a holdover from the um, from the whole thing with the Eliakim argument, Batutsi, Swansona, et cetera, where their whole language and their whole framing of this issue or of the issues of whose paradigm, um, whose paradigm is supported biblically, they'd frame it as, oh, well, what's better expected on this paradigm? And I genuinely do not like that framing just because like that's not a good way to do history um it's where you're where you have the two hypotheses you look at the data and it's like well my hypothesis is better expected on this and it's like well yeah yeah maybe but but it could also be equally expectant of a billion other hypotheses with larger or smaller differences um from your own the, the better way rather to frame it is to look at the very precise, it, it is to articulate the very precise phenomena at play, which supports your case over and against um, all breaks. Now, granted, John does that, um, but he kind of overlays that. Um, Theo, sorry, Theo does that um, with the, um, whatchamacallit, <clears throat> with his case, but he overlays it a bit too much with the whole expectancy language. Um, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm just not, I'm just not a fan of it because it brings back bad memories with Bayes and, and all that. <laughs> Let's look at the facts here. Biblically, we can show that Jesus believed in a seat or cathedra of Moses. We can also show that Jesus thought that the Pharisees sat in that seat. We can show that Moses himself was appointed to his office directly by God, which included this seat. We can show that this seat commanded obedience. And we can show that the tradition that Jesus was referring to here was an oral interpretive tradition held to be infallible by those who sat in this seat. And finally, we know that this oral tradition was believed to have been given to Moses at the same time as the law. It was supposed to be part of the original Mosaic deposit. And yet, we can also show that Jesus believed that God's word should never be nullified, not even by the interpretive authority that God ordained to sit in this seat. Notice here all the similarities between the claims of the Pharisees and Roman Catholics. Both claim to sit in a cathedra. Both claim their tradition goes back to the beginning. Both claim their traditions are infallible. But notice that Jesus never once appeals to any infallible Jewish tradition as the final authority. He only appeals to scripture. This implies that unless one can establish a clear and relevant difference between the Pharisees' oral tradition and the Catholic Eastern Orthodox oral tradition, it is highly likely that Jesus would hold scripture above any such tradition when they conflict. Let me repeat that. If there ever is a conflict between scripture and tradition, scripture always wins out. This implies that there is a hierarchy where scripture sits above the interpretive tradition which is exactly what my definition of sola scriptura entails. And this is exactly what you see in Mark 7. Mark Beautifully articulated. Beautifully articulated. Um, yeah, not really much more to... No, there's not really much to say about that. He got right to the point. He got right to this is what this is showing. Um, these are the presuppositions that the text shows, not just immediately what's happening, but the assumptions that undergird what's happening, why it's actually able to happen that way. Um, and <clears throat> my man, Jeff, he, he articulates it well, too. Um, the better point is that if you assume two authorities are infallible, you will harmonize them. So why is Jesus criticizing him? Yep, exactly. Um, John doesn't say exactly that. Um, he doesn't say exactly, uh, Theo doesn't say exactly that. <laughs> no comment. Theo doesn't say exactly that. Um, but he, he, he effectively says the same thing by pointing to, hey, 
um you should like what wh wh there's no assumption here um and 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 the re and um what you call and so it this fits within the solar scriptura paradigm um now the reason why i don't like the and i know john's commenting on it the reason why i don't like the inference to the as he calls it in the comments the inference to the best explanation which lowers his burden of proof which is which is fair enough um but but the reason i don't like that is because in the end it's um both sides would be able to equally explain this passage um what should we call it if uh if he just says yeah but the church has this ability later but um but yeah again either way it's just a, it's more just a nitpick on the very nuanced precision of framing which i have otherwise in terms of substance beautiful argument and as john theo freaking hell sorry mate <laughs> as theo um articulates here and as he will finish off um it is it does establish that my position is actually the default from this so you need to demonstrate that actually this phenomenon of the fallibility of oral transmission is somehow changed with the church that's the that's the good thing to do and that's what he does that's what theo does do um and it works well seven also shows that in principle there is a possibility that the two could nullify one another hmm. so we would need a clear reason to think that any such possibility would, would be ruled out today so out of all the christian authority structures on offer sola scriptura seems to be better expected on mark seven it shows that if an interpretive tradition conflicts with scripture, then it is tradition that must submit to scripture mm -hmm. and not the other way around, which is exactly what you would expect on sola scriptura. This explanation is far less ad hoc than rivals, has greater explanatory power and scope, and it coheres better with rational background assumptions about human nature and the authority of God's words. Therefore, given Mark 7, sola scriptura is the more biblical hypothesis. For convenience, here is all this laid out in a syllogism. One, Jesus's words in Mark 7 are best explained by one of the following hypotheses about church authority, sola scriptura or an infallible church. Two, Jesus's words in Mark 7 are not best explained on an infallible church hypothesis. Three, therefore, Jesus's words in Mark 7 are best explained by sola scriptura. Four, therefore, sola scriptura. Now, William and others might say, yes, we can agree with this Mark 7 principle. But this principle only applies to human interpretive tradition. But our, interpret our interpretive tradition is not human. It is infallible and guaranteed to be true by God. But in response to this, I would simply argue that this is very unlikely on several grounds. One, are we to expect that Jesus would promise us a church like that? A church that is infallible and is therefore incapable of being wrong in its teachings? Consider, the church itself is founded entirely on Jesus' teaching and that's what its mission is centered around. But think of what the idea of infallibility means. It means that the church's teaching cannot possibly be wrong. And if the church's teaching cannot possibly be wrong, this means that its teaching is beyond the reach of correction, challenge, or testing by anything else, including by Jesus's very own words. So how likely is it that Jesus would promise a church that is founded on his words, but then is totally immune to being corrected by his words? It seems very unlikely on its face. More directly, Jesus never promises such a church. Two, there is an argument to be made that an infallible interpretation is just new revelation, which conflicts with the biblical data that revelation has ceased. Here's why. Infallibility only comes from God, and the church itself cannot speak infallibly apart from God. So if the church infallibly declares an interpretation, then by necessity it is God who is declaring it through the church and not the church itself. Since again, only God is infallible. And if God is infallibly declaring things to the church, then God is still speaking. And if God is still speaking, then revelation has not ceased. But since this conflicts with the biblical data, as well as official Roman Catholic teaching, we would not expect a church like this. Three, the application of Mark 7 itself. Almost all of us believe that scripture still has application for us today beyond just its immediate context. So what would the application of Mark 7 be today? The lesson in Mark 7 is about which has the final authority. Uh, before I get to this bit, there, his reply to the objection that, oh, but they, they have human traditions. We have infallible traditions. Yeah, it was, it was decent, but there was the more, there was a, there was a much better point that he didn't really make here. 
Um, and that's the one that basically Jeff himself brings up here. The Pharisees themselves thought their traditions were from God. They asserted this is of divine origin. This is of divine revelation <clears throat> uh, from orally from Moses down to our time. Just read the very beginning of Tractate Aboth in the Talmud. And so, um, and so no, so therefore they did claim that's, that's the point. That's the whole point. They claim their traditions were divine, but Christ denied that very category. He looked at their oral traditions and rather than submit, and as Jeff said, try to harmonize them, he just denied, no, nah, it's wrong. Here's what the word of God, which is written says, and he never appeals to anything that is unwritten apart from of course his own self-revelation because he is the son of the father and so um and so that would have been the better more immediate point to make that would just struck that down immediately because it shows that pheno uh, phenomenologically the exact same thing is happening pharisees claim to be the divine interpreters of scripture rome claims to be the divine interpreter of scripture um and so that would be a beautiful way to have flipped it back and to say so no you still have the burden because just because you claim, because the, the Pharisees didn't claim any different anything different from you and they were wrong. So now you have the burden to show us where did Christ give you this authority and this particular charism? That's That would have been the better way to reply to that. Should Mark 7 be today? The lesson in Mark 7 oh. what's the final authority, ecclesial authority or the word of God? If the ecclesial authority for today is simply presumed infallible, and unable to be corrected by the word of God, then I'm afraid that Mark 7 really has no application for the church today. But this seems very unlikely. And finally, four, there is, a, there is an abundance of biblical evidence that no one simply has a presumption of infallibility, not even prophets or apostles. In Deuteronomy 18, you see that the office of prophet had to be tested against scripture. And then in Galatians 1.8, Paul says that even if an apostle or an angel from heaven teaches you another gospel, then let them be anathema. Thus, Paul suggests that even their message needs to be subject to the word of God. Thus, everything is to be tested against and subjected to the word of God. There is no presumption of infallibility given to humans. Okay, now this is probably where I have the most disagreement with John. Um, and, it, and it does require a necessary distinction too. Uh, is there a presumption of infallibility um, for the apostles, I believe that yes, actually there is, um, especially with the Gospel of John, where it speaks of Christ specifically sending the, the, the Paraclete or the Holy Spirit to the apostles, and that um, He will guide you, the apostles, into all truth. Um, and you can also argue, as I have historically, I've, I've wavered a little bit on it, but but in the past, I've argued that Matthew sixteen with the binding and loosing that's a refer to their their prophetic foreknowledge of all that's in heaven. Um, so in that sense, I do believe that, yes, in the Christian paradigm, there is there is an assumption of apostolic infallibility. That's, in fact, actually the basis of Sola Scriptura. Why is Scripture the final authority? Because the apostles did have a special protection of their teaching from the Holy Spirit. Um, if it's not, then it, Scripture could still be, in a sense, a final authority, but also not really. The authority of Scripture would be a difference of degree and not of kind, as it is under actual Sola Scriptura. Um and so to explain that Galatians 1 8 passage, it does it does say even if an angel or an apostle tells you to speak a different gospel, then um speak a different gospel from you, um, then you don't believe it. Now that's true, but the issue is this is a hypothetical conditional. So it's not actually admitting that this will happen, at least specifically of the 12. The, the, the category of apostle, by the way, was a bit was a bit more wider in the first century. Um there are a number of like people who weren't equal to the 12, for example, who were called apostles. Um, so it could be inclusive of them. But in, but in any way, I think he does nonetheless even think of himself. If hypothetically um, I or any other apostle or an angel teaches you a different gospel, you don't believe it. And that's true. That's that's that's, that's a completely true hypothetical principle. Now, we could grant that in principle this won't happen, um, but this is a point of falsification, of course. And so if we did find that one of the 12 officially taught against the gospel, then, uh-oh, we got a problem. Um, but, in any, but in any case, um, it's only a hypothetical conditional, basically to emphasize that uh, the gospel is paramount. No one can contradict it. And I guess in context as well, we uh, in context, Paul's definitely thinking of what happens like immediately after in the text in Galatians with Peter. 
Um, <clears throat> he wasn't, contrary to what some say, he wasn't officially teaching Judaizing theology. He gave in to their pressure um, and sat apart from the Gentiles. So in that, in that secondary derivative sense, he was teaching against the gospel, not, not officially, but he was in that sense by his actions teaching against the gospel. Um, and so that could be something that contextualizes Paul's statement as well. But in any case, so yeah, that's, that's probably my most substantive part of disagreement with, um, with John. And, and if I was with Theo, with Theo, um, because if I was William, I could have focused on that point. Um, and said, well, hang on, if there's no presumption of infallibility, even for the apostles, and, and that does need to be made precise, by the way, it's not that the apostles, when they wrote a grocery list, it was infallible. It's specifically when they're in their office of apostle, when they're preaching the gospel officially. Um, but if I was William, I would have definitely exploited that in the rebuttal and said, well, hang on, if there's no presumption of infallibility, even for the apostles, then what's the basis of Sola Scriptura? How do you know any of scripture is infallible, infallibly protected? I mean, yeah. But um, <clears throat> because what the apostles themselves preaching is being used as the criteria for judging things as the word of God, or at least cognizant to it. Um, they're our sole, they're really our sole primary sources for the life of Christ and what Christ himself taught. So, eh, eh. Um, but in any, in any case, in any case. So that's definitely... That's definitely the biggest point of disagreement I have with him. Um, thankfully, though, um, as far as I remember, William doesn't pick up on this. Um, and, in, and in the end, uh, John still does, even if potentially inconsistently, he still does hold to the main thesis, which we, which I agree with. So um, nonetheless, the rest of his argument is pretty solid. So why should we think that the church has this presumption more than an apostle does? Mm -hmm. So seeing how this presumption is denied in both the Old and New Testaments, and that all are to be subject to scripture, it seems very... There was one distinction I forgot to make. So the distinction I wanted to make is that <clears throat> in another sense, it is true that there's no presumption of infallibility in that it was a presumed right of potential believers to actually examine what the apostles said and see whether it was in line with the word of God. And they'll praise for it. Like you have the noble Bereans, of course, that's, that's the locus classicus of this, where they tested what Paul said against Holy Scripture. Um, and why that is also, so, so, so in that sense, yes, there was a presumption of infallibility, at least for those who weren't within the church. But then once they came into the church, into the faith and accepted that paradigm, they would then accept, okay, what these apostles say is actually definitional to the faith. So once I'm in, I can't question what they say. Um, now, why that's important is that in, it's it's extremely relevant to the related debate on scriptural perspicuity because you'll have the likes of Brian Cross and um, uh, more recently Casey Chalk in his The Obscurity of Scripture where they will deny even the mere validity of people testing the Roman Catholic Church, which is the Roman Church, against the standard of scripture because that is presupposing the right to private judgment and that is presupposing perspicuity, which they deny. They think that to have a truly objectively certain and authoritative interpretation of Holy Scripture, you must do so through the church. And so to judge the church according to Scripture is actually question-begging and doesn't work. But we have exactly that with the Bereans and they're praised for it. There's no objection to it at all. Um, so that it's, it's very relevant for that debate. Thankfully, good credit to William, I don't think he's a rabid anti-perspicuity guy. He seems to be the opposite. He seems to be very confident in being able to prove like every Roman doctrine straight from scripture, um, which I can, hey, I can respect. I definitely disagree, but I can respect. So yeah. <laughs> Unlikely that this would not be in effect today. And this is what we'd expect on the Sola Scriptura hypothesis. So in summary, I think I've provided two. Freaking hilarious, Jay Athanasius. You got the whole. You didn't get the whole bus laughing, but you got me laughing. <laughs> Very strong arguments for thinking that Sola Scriptura is biblical. Moving forward, I want the audience to pay special attention to what my opponent must show in order to refute my argument. He may say all kinds of things about the canon or who gets to interpret or these other things, but that is not the topic of the debate today. The topic of debate is whether Sola Scriptura is biblical. So in order to directly refute my argument, he has to address exactly what my argument says. 
He has to show that what we ha he has something today other than the scriptures that contain what God says to the church and that sola scriptura is not the best explanation for the data um, of Mark 7. So unless and until he does, and my argument goes through. Happy Reformation Day. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Theo, for that opening statement. Appreciate you. All right, William, you are now in the seat and you are ready to go for your 15 minute opening. And Let me I will. Get that. So uh, this is where the fun begins. As my childhood hero, Anakin Skywalker said in Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, Scene 1, The Battle Over Coruscant. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, this is where the fun begins. Now, I'm not gonna I'm I'm not gonna rip on us on William as hard as many other people on my side have. <clears throat> um, I I don't want to per se say that I'm gonna rip on him at least on his case, but I will say the latter part of his case in his opening. I'm I'm oh boy I'm gonna I am gonna I'm gonna rip into that a little bit. I will say uh, out of all out of all respect and uh, and niceness to him. Um, but yeah, guys, expect for some uh, expect some fun with this one open all right well, let me get my timer up great okay what and i guess to begin as soon as i begin yep i'll start the time as soon as you start all right here we go thank you everybody for being here happy halloween today our goal is not particularly to present a comprehensive case against the doctrine of sola scriptura the man-made doctrine which asserts that the bible alone is the sole and ultimate authority in matters of faith and morals, matters of faith and practice. The burden of proof, and you're going to notice, I'm not going to be responding to the opening statement of my brother here at all. That wouldn't be fair. That will be done in the rebuttal period. So if there's any overlap, it's because I've already prepared it, but there's a lot that I'm not going to be responding to until my rebuttal, probably 99% of it. So today, the burden of proof... So this is good. I like this. Um, he's explicit about that. He's not responding to another guy's opening statement. That's great. That's debate 101. That's just unfair. Um, I, I remember there was a, I remember in another debate, an older debate between Mike Lacona and Matt Dillahunty. Lacona, I'm, I haven't seen the full thing. I'm sure that he trounced Dillahunty in substance, but there was a big blunder at the start. Um, after the opening statements, when Lacona gave his opening statement, Dillahunty gave his, and then Lacona gave his first rebuttal. And in his first rebuttal, he said, oh, notice how Dillahunty didn't respond to my opening at all. And then Dillahunty started his opening by saying, uh, you're not supposed to do that, mate. This is like debating one-on-one. So that's a bit of a bit of a rut raw raggy moment. But in any case, um, yeah, it's 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 basic, but it's good that Albrecht's acknowledging that. And so he's acknowledging and making explicit that everything he's arguing here was just the stuff he pre-prepared. Now, that's great for him, but it's also not great because it shows that, as you guys will see. He did not prepare for Theo's good and nuanced understanding of Sola Scriptura, the, the proper Reformation era understanding of Sola Scriptura. He prepared for more of, he prepared more for a pop level case, um, which is going to bite him, which is going to, which is going to bite him in the, um, in substance. Uh, so yeah, you guys are going to see that. Proof. For those that hold the solar scriptura is squarely on my brother's shoulders, and I am not only skeptical that he can fulfill that burden, I know for a fact that he is not going to. The standard of solar scriptura has never been a part of the ancient apostolic faith. It is a theological novelty, a novum, that Calvin, Zwingli, Luther, all of the reformers held to differently than my brother here. They didn't even hold to it in the same way. They didn't even hold the scripture in the same way. You're going to find that there is a massive amount of divergence. So today I'm going to show you what do we so, so notice here already right at the start, um, there is irrelevance right at the beginning. Um, big, big issues. Um, he's already going off the... He's already going off the debate topic as they settled it. Is sola scriptura biblical? Now, if you want to argue it's a complete theological novelty, all that jazz, great, fantastic. All John would need to do, I mean, he, he, he's, he's wrong, but for the sake of it, all that Theo would need to do 
is just say, um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll grant that. Yeah, complete theological novelty. Um, no one of the church fathers held to sola scriptura. Complete novelty. And the reformers, uh, the reformers all uh, disagreed on it. Yep, yeah, great. Um, my argument still stands. <laughs> it's still true. Um, so, because these are lo- like just in the abstract, those are logically compatible propositions. There's nothing incompatible about them. All that it would do is be a falsification of the Christian faith, <laughs> but they're not logically incompatible. So he just needed basically do a do a bit of a philosophical zombie, if you will, and just say. Yeah, sure. Grant, I'll grant all those premises. They do not touch my argument. That's all John would need to do. Unfortunately, I don't, if from memory, I don't think he does do that. And it would have been great if he did. But but in any case, already there's irrelevant points given by William here. What do I need to do today? Do I need to show you all today that the Catholic Church is infallible or to talk about any kind of traditions outside of the Bible? Not at all. I simply need to demonstrate how the Bible, the Old and the New Testament, And I am going to supplement church fathers as commentaries. Of course, I know this debate is about scripture alone being biblical, but I use them as commentaries. I know the brother doesn't believe they are authoritative. I do. But I'm going to utilize them as commentaries to show that none support the notion of exclusive reliance in scripture as the sole authority in Christian doctrine and practice. One, not a reformational view, and I'm going to get to that a little bit later. Um, but two, again, you're, we, we already seeing how he prepped for a much less developed case than Theo. Um, when William said, I'm not going to argue for an infallible Catholic church or traditions outside the Bible. Well, that's kind of, that's actually a bit of a problem now because Theo is already granted that there are divinely protected infallible oral traditions. Um, at least in the apostolic period. I'm sure he'd grant the same for the prophetic period when they were alive and walking. <clears throat> um, and so and so he's arguing against something that Theo actually just totally grants. He's going to argue against something that Theo totally grants, which is a, which is bad. It's not good. Um, yeah, it shows that he, wasn't, he didn't prepare for the same case that Theo did. In the Old Testament, there is no concept of sola scriptura. Great. And this belief in scripture alone faces significant hurdles. The Old Testament is without a doubt a part of the foundation life of the Christians, myself and the brother. There's nowhere that you can find any idea of sola scriptura. And I know some people have attempted to show that to be the case. There's nowhere there. Deuteronomy 7, 17, 8 to 13, the passage, God commands that difficult cases and controversies be brought before priests and judges. Their decisions were to be obeyed, emphasizing the importance of religious authority beyond the written law. Malachi 2.7, the prophet Malachi describes the role of the priest as a messenger of the Lord, highlighting the importance of human authority in teaching and in interpreting God's will. Nehemiah 8, when Ezra the scribe read the law to the people, he was assisted by other leaders who helped the people to understand the law. The Old Testament, of course, would not be our battleground, if you will, to show the false doctrine of Sola Scriptura, to show that the doctrine of Sola Scriptura is false. But we can show you that this principle um, is nowhere to be found, neither in the Old or in the New Testament. In the New Testament, the case against Scripture alone becomes even stronger. There's not a single passage, and I know the brother likely is not going to argue for one single passage. I know that even the reformers didn't do that. But they argued for a kind of overall case cobbled together from all other kinds of passages. And I can tell you right now, there's nothing there, nothing at all. Uh, Rather, we find the opposite. The New Testament contains passages that highlight the importance of sacred tradition and the church as an authoritative institution. Now, today, we're not debating the infallibility of the church, but we're showing that sacred tradition, if there is something else that is viewed as having the authority as God's word, then the idea of scripture alone being the only thing where God's word is preserved, really, it falls apart. So already, this is going to show William's opening is going to have two very different effects for two different types of people watching this debate. There's either the very shallow thinkers um, on the ro- so on the Roman side, I'm not saying all the Roman side are shallow thinkers, but for shallow thinkers on the Roman side, this is a 
beautiful smashing case. William knows how to get right to um, right to the popular level audience. His his debate strategy of giving these long florilegia or lists of citations, whether from scripture or the fathers or whatever, um, it's on the face very persuasive, prima facie. It looks like he has a very strong and well presented case. I mean, as well as on top of the fact that he's got Riz. He's got he's, he's straight up got Riz. <laughs> he's very very confident in these debates. So those things combined, um, they will be extremely effective for the shallow thinkers who are on the Roman side. Now, for the deeper thinkers um, on either side, uh, it's possible still deeper thinkers can be clouded by their bias. But, but in any case, presuming charity, deeper thinkers on both sides will be able to immediately see how, in terms of an actual rebuttal, William hasn't actually said anything. Like he, he thinks he has, but he actually hasn't. Because all of these things, um, in terms of an authoritative church, uh, in some sense, that's a very wide semantic range, that adge adjective, and, and also sacred tradition, Theo actually granted uh, at least the sacred tradition, but he didn't explicitly talk about the authoritative church, but he didn't say it was not authoritative. He was specifically talking about the quality of infallibility. That's a very particular quality. Um, but with regard to sacred tradition, he granted the oral teaching of the apostles was as protected and as authoritative and infallible as their written teaching. But Theo's case, the problem was that we don't have that anymore. Not their verbatim oral words that were not written down. Um, now, again, obviously William, he didn't, he didn't, he's not responding directly to Theo's case. He prepared this beforehand, but that's kind of the problem. He prepared for an opponent much less prepared and intelligent than Theo. Um, and so for the intelligent listener, um, who unfortunately may not even be the majority, let's be real, of listeners, but for the intelligent listener, they should be able to tell already he, he actually hasn't even put even a scratch in Theo's case. He, he hasn't even addressed the major points. 2 Thessalonians 2.15, the apostle Paul is very clear. He says, so then, brothers, stand firm. Hold of the traditions you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. This clearly affirms the incredible value of both the oral and the written scripture. And I know the argument my opponent and other Protestants will make. They'll say, well, you know, it's talking about the gospel, only the gospel. No, it's not. No, it isn't. And I can show that to the overwhelming, exclusive, uh, uh, overwhelming, unanimous testimony of the patristic interpretation of this. So the burden not of is to show that this is referring to traditions that are all found within scripture alone. It's not. You're to hold to the oral and the written. They are both the word of God, not only the written. And Theo agrees. Theo 100% granted that in his opening statement. Again, I know, I know William's not responding to him directly, but that's, that's the big mistake that William made with his preparation. He wasn't prepared to go against the more nuanced opponent. My, my friend today is going to have quite, quite the journey up that hill, up that hill to show that Scripture alone is the normative standard. If no, we're in the Scripture itself. Is there anything even remotely, remotely there for this? Matthew 18, 15 to 18. Here, Christ outlines a process for resolving disputes within the church, indicating the church's authority in matters of discipline and doctrine. That's very important that I want to emphasize over and over and over. Whenever we look, we find that Scripture alone is not, is not the only authority. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 2, we read verse 13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Granted. Now, pay attention. The word of God, which you heard from us. Now, what do we mean by tradition? Now, we can we call it sacred tradition. Why do we call it sacred tradition? Because if the Lord tells us then what you're going to hand down is going to be protected by the Holy Spirit, you can better believe it is sacred. The, the very word tradition comes from the Greek word paradosis. Paradosis, which is what is handed down. We don't believe that only the word of God is confined to scripture alone because, well, guess what? The scripture alone doesn't say that. Now, if there was a hint of that in the scripture alone, well, you know, maybe we would have something there. Even in the, pa the, the popular 
battleground passage of 2 Timothy 3, even in that particular mm -hmm. passage, we have traditions that are mentioned early on in that passage. We have traditions that are mentioned in Acts 17. You want to be a noble Berean? Do you want to be a noble Berean? What do the noble Bereans do? They search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. What a noble Berean, sticking to sola scriptura, right? But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul of Berea, so it is preached, it is oral, and it is written down. I suggest all of us be like the noble Bereans today and realize that the word of God is within the scriptura, within the scripture, and also orally taught, handed down. Yes, there are apostolic teachings that were handed down. Not all of them are found in the scriptura. And we so, okay. So basically, a lot of repeating himself here and a lot of repeating points that he just... It's, what else is there much more to say other than what I've already said before? Um, all of these things are preempted and they're either granted or they're not relevant to Theo's case, as he already made. Um, yeah, and he did immediately jump to the issue of, well, there's these doctrines that are not contained in scripture. Well, hang on a second. <clears throat> that, that, that would be relevant if he could show that to be the case biblically but then again it would that, that, that you, you can't even prove that with the parameters of this debate because the whole thing is is sola scriptura biblical you can't prove like the whole argument that there's doctrines that aren't biblical that that's literally outside of the parameters of the debate because the whole thing is about the biblical data and so if it's in if you're trying to find if you're making an argument for something in scripture unless you can find a passage that says hey everything um by the way uh not everything that we require you to know as Christians will be written down. Well, they never say that. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So, because the apostles taught oral teaching definitively, therefore, Sola Scriptura is false, rough, uh, rotful. Yeah, exactly. And that's, um, that's, and that's exactly what Theo's case preempted and spoke against. Um, yeah. You got a massive problem today. If my friend, I don't want to call him opponent. I, I can't stand that. He's, he's, he's a brother. We've been in communication. Uh, I, I consider him a brother. I consider him a good guy. So excuse me if I ever say opponent. I mean to say brother. Uh, my brother, uh, despite being my brother, has quite the hill to climb today. Uh, and I'm not going to lend him any climbing gear at all. Uh, the problem being is you very clearly find that the normative paradigm in Scripture is not Scripture alone, because if you stick to Scripture alone, you got a big problem. How do you even determine what the Scriptura is? Now, I know that okay. Protestants realize that the this is where this is where it starts to get worse, because now he's going to go into the he's going to go among other multiple other things he's going to get into. I'm going to stop a lot more frequently for those. He gets into the whole oh, but McCannon argument, which is completely irrelevant to the debate. The canon is presumed in this debate. This is, this is a given in this debate. And so debating about, well, can Sola Scriptura be reconciled with a definitive canon? That's a, that's a good debate to have, but it's literally not this debate. The Bible is being presumed. Achilles' heel of Protestantism <clears throat> is the canon. There's no way at all that you're going to be able to come to a consensus on what the canon is. I saw a number of videos that my, my brother put out particularly telling people it's okay no need for worry we got michael kruger and the michael kruger theory there, there's really no problem uh whatever is scriptura you know it, it holds on to the model of apostolicity still doesn't help you discover or come to the conclusion of how you determine what is your standard if that is your standard how do you determine it you need tradition there's no way around it not even if you put on the greatest of tinfoil hats in the world are you going to receive revelation to tell you all of these books are what comprise Holy Scriptura. You got a big problem there, and I might just say Bible alone from now on so that I don't have to keep saying Sola Scriptura over and over. This has never been the standard ever. I remember how I told you all that I would talk a little bit of the early church. This was never the standard ever. Some Relevant. Protestants like to say, well, in the beginning it wasn't, and later on it became the, uh, the normative standard. I've heard of... Uh, okay, this is slightly more relevant. So this is, he's starting to get actually back on track um, to an argument that Theo does make. And, and to, to bring it back to what he said a bit earlier, the normative paradigm was scripture and tradition in the early church. I'm sorry, in the Bible. Theo granted that. 
He, he, he granted that entirely, that there was oral preaching in the time of the apostles. Obviously, ipso facto, when a New Testament text was written, even the last one, there was still an apostle live who was giving oral teaching. So obviously, his argument was a was rather the the principles given to us in scripture applied historically to our position today that was his argument not that the precise proposition of soul scripture is in the bible he explicitly denied that but rather the principles in the bible even in times where there was oral teaching that was of equal authority nonetheless when you apply those principles to today soul scripture is necessary that's my exact argument as well and that's perfectly valid. That's exactly what the reformers would say too. Um, so that, that doesn't violate Sola Scriptura at all. It's just the present application of biblical principles. That's it. That's 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 exactly how Sola Scriptura works. It's applying biblical principles to today. Um, so again, he, he clearly did not prepare for that basic kind of argument. And now he's going off into irrelevant stuff about, oh, the church believed this, the church believed that. How do you resolve the canon? Literally all of those could be true. Sola Scriptura cannot establish, uh, if you believe in Sola Scriptura, you cannot establish with any certainty the canon whatsoever. Um, and nobody in the early church until the Reformation believed in Sola Scriptura. Those could all be true. And they're logically compatible with Theo's case that Sola Scriptura is biblical. It would just mean that the faith is falsified, but, but it's logically possible, logically. So that doesn't actually change anything theologians like uh like dr white say that and i am not comparing uh, my brother to dr white i'm just saying a lot of people say that william webster white swan uh my friend and dear dear friend turretin fan I, and i don't agree i don't think that ever becomes the normative standard it wasn't in the apostolic era where ignatius of antioch orders those to stick to the bishop where irenaeus urges those to stick to tradition not tr tradition alone but bible and tradition Oh dear, now he's in my wheelhouse. The first and second century, and increasingly, increasingly over over more recent time, the third century fathers as well. Especially my boy Irenaeus. Oh dear. Um okay. <laughs> okay. Um, everyone look up my debate on Alan Rule's channel. Um, my debate with Matthew Powell on whether Irenaeus held to reformational thinking uh, with regards to theological authority. Because I will, and the reason why I, I made sure the debate was framed in that particular way was because I granted that Irenaeus doesn't necessarily per se believe or practice soul scriptura directly, but he does affirm all the principles that do make it necessary for the Reformation and that he is fundamentally a Reformational figure. So look at that debate. I proved beyond a shadow of a doubt, Irenaeus is not on William's side. He's on our side. He's our boy. Irenaeus is an Anglican. <laughs> um, like, likewise with Ignatius, stick with the bishop. I mean, okay, but that's like, that's, is, that's just irrelevant to the debate. These are... It's not even just logically compatible. It's even compatible in an ecclesial tradition of any ecclesi of a Protestant ecclesial tradition to assert scripture alone is infallible and you should stick by your bishop. Don't schism from him. Those are completely compatible statements. There's nothing incompatible about them. <clears throat> we don't have any, any of the apostolic churches holding to the idea of scripture alone. Remember, there was a time when we were all united, my Oriental Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, Catholic. Which one of these apostolic churches does the Assyrian Church of the East hold the scripture alone? Oriental Orthodox, Eastern, Catholic, none of them do. None of them. Dr. Brock, who is a near and dear friend of mine, says, he told me personally as I reached out to him, he said, Sola Scriptura is not apostolic. None of the apostolic churches have a clue as to what that is. That is a modern day invention. Now, by modern day, of course, he means at the time of the Reformation. Scholar and theologian Father John McGuckin, an expert on the early Eastern Christian tradition, reflecting on the Oriental Orthodox and Eastern tradition, says the early Christian community understood faith to be a dynamic reality lived out within the community's liturgical life. Protestants don't know what liturgos is. They don't know about the liturgical no. life of the church. If they did know about it, they wouldn't be spouting this teaching of scripture alone.
Mr. Albrecht, please look at the camera. Can you tell me what this is? Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Protestants don't know what a liturgos is. They don't have a liturgical... Okay, so first of all, he says it liturgus, but I presume it sounds like he's trying to say liturgos. Liturgos is a person. It's a public servant more generally, or in the church, it refers to a minister in a liturgical sense. Um, Pro- Protestants have ministers. We, 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 we do. Even, even Pastor Jim's Bible church has ministers, has a liturgos. So he's probably more accurately trying to think of liturgia, which refers to uh, the where we get the word today, liturgy. It refers to that service in general. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, in the more exp- in the more developed aspect of liturgical worship, like set order for worship and tradition, and so on and so forth. Uh, y- y- yeah, we 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 do, but, 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 but we have that. Yeah, Lutherans have that. Even the Reformed, every one of the Reformation traditions had liturgy. It, it, just because you don't like it doesn't mean it's not a liturgy. We've got that. And liturgical life <laughs> just estab- it, it does establish and perpetuate the normative pattern of doctrine in a communion. The BCP, the BCP especially, you will have um you will have Anglican bishops and authors and what have you. They will argue directly from the BCP. Because it is the su- the assumed doctrinal standard under scripture, of course, but it's taken for granted as our doc- as a serious doctrinal standard, even though it's liturgical. Yes, we do have that, mate. We do. What are you even? Oh my word, bro. Oh dear, this is not. Mm, this is not good. Not good at all. Um. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I specified Reformation traditions. Ba- Baptists aren't a Reformation tradition. They're, they're, they're not. They're, they're just not. Alone of Bible alone. Indeed, they don't know about the liturgical life of the church because that was the life of the church. You'd go to Mass. Yes, it was Mass. I hate to break it to you, Protestant friends. It was Mass wherever you went in the world. Yeah, Anglicans call it Mass too. But in any case, um, I, I forgot the other point. None of the apostolic churches, they believe in Sola Scriptura, uh, uh Irrelevant, completely irrelevant. Um, now, obviously, you can argue against that historically and whether that means anything. Oh, look, the churches of Jerusalem, Rome, Antioch, and all that, they they don't believe in this. Okay, so what? Uh, you, you, you believe you believe four out of the five patriarchates of, of, the, of those apostolic churches all fell away except for Rome. You're just one extra step from us, I guess. So, so what? Like, okay. Who cares? But but in any case, I don't want to get I don't want to get distracted. Those are all irrelevant arguments, completely irrelevant arguments to the debate at hand. Is sola scriptura biblical? Aye, aye, aye. Even during the time of Luther, Luther held to that belief. And the Bible was never intended to function as a standalone authority. It is a living faith of the community that provides the context for interpreting the scripture, the tradition. Father John McGuckin says, "Can you can you prove Eastern it biblically, please?" Orthodox Church with its rich theological heritage, has consistently rejected Scripture alone. You just have to look at Yassi and the confession of the Scythius to find that to be a reality. But Orthodox theologian Father Alexander Sherman says, in Orthodoxy, tradition is not the past. Wait, is, it, is, it, is it Sherman or is it Schmeman? Because I know there's Alexander Schmeman. I think he's thinking of him. A whole life of the church, that life in which the Holy Spirit dwells and through which he acts. Tradition is a church. And of course, I am a Roman Catholic. I am a Catholic. And the Catholic scholar Romanist. perspective can be summed up in the great Cardinal Avery Dulles, a prominent Catholic Romanist. theologian who says, he once remarked, the authority of the church cannot be derived from the Bible alone. The church is not a mere product of the word. Rather, it is a living community that produces the word, discerns it, and bears witness to it. None, none of the apostolic churches had a clue to what this novelty was. None of them. Augustine would be turning over in his grave as St. Augustine argued and debated against the heretic Maximian. Don't Google Google, um, 
watch me call it <laughs> don't google the um a book two of against the donatists in augustine guys don't do that no simeon what was Mac simeon arguing it's like hey man show me the holy trinity from the bible alone we're not going to hold to that nicene creed that tradition of yours get me the doctrine of the trinity from the bible alone interestingly enough the very first time to Timothy is utilized, is utilized in favor of Solar Scriptura. It's utilized by an Arian to argue against the doctrine of the Trinity. Citation needed, but also completely irrelevant. As oh my word, it's doesn't it, surprise me at all. This is <clears throat> this is what I meant when I said, like, towards the end, it just goes off the rails. Because like all of these points, like a citation. Well, he he did give the occasional citation, but even then he doesn't read from it. But either way, A, citation needed, and B, it's completely irrelevant to most of the stuff. It's, oh, my word, cuz. Because when you look at the life of the early church, council after council, we're talking about real meat and potato stuff. We're not talking about uh, playground child's play stuff. We're talking about the Council of Nicaea, Second Constantinople, Ephesus, Nicaea, where over and over the formulations reflect the biblical language of the Apostles' Creed and embody apostolic tradition. Remember, what was it that the great St. Athanasius, St. Augustine, and everybody stood for and fought the Bible and sacred tradition? They were being attacked by the Bible, from the Bible by the heretics. And they were saying, what are you talking about? The great Ignatius, those great fathers of old, the great tradition of the church has never held to Scripture alone. You find those testimonies at Nicaea, Second Nicaea, and on. When East and West were united. My point today is not to make this a debate about early church fathers. I utilize them to show that the lived life of the early church looks nothing, nothing like modern day Protestant, Protestantism puts forth. And I want to be careful when I say modern day Protestantism. I don't think modern day evangelicals resemble anything of Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, Arminius, or any of those, or Turretin. So I don't. So that last point, I very appreciate that. That's good. But oh my word, cuz. So he he actually straight up said, I demonstrated the early church doesn't believe in soul scriptura. Once again, for the 12th umptillionth time, completely irrelevant to the debate topic. Is sola scriptura biblical? Not is sola scriptura patristic? Not even is sola scriptura true per se? Is sola scriptura biblical? That is the point of the debate. But even putting that to the side, he didn't demonstrate anything. He made a ton of assertions. He would occasionally reference a specific work, but he wouldn't cite anything, wouldn't read anything off. Oh, my word. My word, bro. Yeah, exactly. It, 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 that's exactly it. The Arians thought they were teaching the definitive traditions of the apostles. Yeah, exactly. You can read, um, you, you, you can read preserved creeds and statements from... Arians themselves or semi-Arians, quote unquote, um, including their own councils where they claim we're teaching the Catholic faith, the Catholic universal whole church from the apostles faith. So by that logic, Hey, Oh, look, they had the same thing. Even bro, even, even, um, even Gnostic people like, um, like Ptolemy second century, his letter to Flora, uh, preserved in Epiphanius. Um, he speaks of the quote unquote apostolic tradition and apostolic succession. So yeah, it's it, it's not a unique claim. It, it's not. So if you want to say, oh, look, Maximinus was Sola Scriptura, therefore Arians, therefore Sola Scriptura bad because Arians use it. Everyone referred to quote unquote apostolic sacred tradition. Oh, my word, cuz. My word. A lot of them held to different doctrines that eventually would be shed later on in history. So, well, whose version of Sola Scriptura is the correct one? The first reformers or the modern? Mine. That's like anyone who's going to make that argument. The only thing you need to respond with is mine because I am arguing for mine. You can throw that exactly back at William. Hey, William, whose version of the, of the, of the three-legged stool is correct? Because there are variations between Catholics or Romanists rather, um, both in the lay level and even on the official level. There's been big debates about the nature of scriptural, traditional and magisterial authority. So, hey, throw that right back at you. Whose version of the magisterium is correct? And we both have an easy, there's an easy answer that we can both employ to this. And that's to say mine, because I'm arguing for mine. 
<laughs> that's, that's what I'm arguing, bro. <laughs> and yeah, exactly. The wider question, whose version of ecclesialism is correct? Hey, is even, even, even putting aside the disagreements within Rome about their own thought, is Rome incorrect? Why not Eastern authority? Why not the Assyrian Church of the East? Why not the Orientals? Why not the set of Acantus of the various? Why not the blessed apostolic magisterium of most holy family monastery? Whose version of ecclesialism, William? Whose is correct? You guys all disagree too. Far out. Modern day ones. What's going on? Are the modern day reformers, are they receiving new revelation to where the doctrines that their forefathers, their forebears held to are no longer there? They're gone? Now, with the final 25 seconds that I have, I can tell you that there are a number of passages that tell you that the word of God is passed down orally and written. In order for Bible yeah. alone to work, you'd have to override that or show that they are the exact same thing. We haven't gotten to cross-examination, but I can guarantee you that my brother will not be able to show that they are the exact same thing every single time. We've got, we've got one second. I'll surrender that. All right. Thank you, William, for the William and uh, Theo for the opening statements. We are now transitioning to our rebuttal round. And Theo, you're back in the seat for your five minutes. Oh, um, man. Okay. I'm not going to lie. I don't know how much more I can. I'm actually very tired from this already. Um, okay. So I'll give it again because I, honestly, I might just skip straight to the cross examination because there are some other big comments I want to give on that. Um, yeah, but yeah, in any case, my summary thing, Theo, very clear case, very well structured. Um, some little nitpicks I have with some of these things here and there, but otherwise a very good and very nuanced case, uh, uh, anticipated many of the key objections, including some, which William straight up gave in his opening. Uh, and so intellectually his, his opening was just solid. Almost 100% solid. Um, <clears throat> and it showed that he, it, it showed, and it was, it was shown that William just was not expecting that kind of case because he replied to a very smooth brain idea of Sola Scriptura. Uh, he cited many biblical passages and many made various, many assertions, which Theo himself said that he either grants or are just not pertinent to his case at all. They They don't address it. And yet William, William made them because he wasn't preparing for a nuanced case like, like Theo. Um, so just in terms of, but, but nonetheless, nonetheless, um, William has the riz. He, he has the riz. Uh, and so he came off sounding much better than he really should have, in my opinion. Um, and unfortunately his riz does take over in the cross-examination, which we'll, which we'll get to. So I'll probably... I'm not going to review this whole thing. Like, I don't, I don't, guys, I don't have time for that. I've got other work to do. You know, I've got to get back to the channel slave labor with with this. But um, but yeah, but yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I'm probably gonna jump straight to cross exam because there's a couple of things I just want to observe with that. Uh, da, 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 da. So no, let's do, the, do so. Let's not balk uh, your opponent's time down along with the questions. Also, I understand that there may be a lead in to the question, but let's not make your lead in too long that absorbs a long amount of time. We want to make this a very interactive cross X. All right. With that said, Theo, you're up first for your 20 minute cross examination of William. And I will start your time as soon as you begin to ask your first question. Okay. Hey, thanks, William. Uh, appreciate it, man. Not taking any of this you, personally or anything. So I, I, I can. No, no, not at all, lot. brother. Not at all, brother. Not yeah. at all. All right. Let me let me get into these questions here. Uh, do you agree that all throughout the Bible we see this idea that what God says has final authority? The Word of God has final authority. Absolutely, yes. Do you see that all throughout the Bible? That the Word of God has final authority. Absolutely, whether it be written form. Or oral form, the words of God okay. are is are, are the authority. Absolutely, yes. That that works. Okay. Has it always been the case that the word of God has final authority? There's never been a time where that was not the case, right? You mean in the Old Testament? Absolutely. As as I read in my opening statement in the, New in, the old, in, in the Old Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, mean, I would say in the Old and the New Testament. Absolutely. The word of God, whether oral or passed down, 
Absolutely. It's the authority. So okay. the difference would be that we don't believe that scripture alone is the only place where God is speaking. Right. Understood. Understood. Um, so you would agree that there are, you can't even put a number on the passages that claim that what God says has final authority. It's just all throughout the Bible. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. All throughout the Bible, all throughout church history. Okay. Are the scriptures the word of God? Yep. Do you agree that in the Bible, we see that the scriptures contain what God says to the church? Yep. Correct. Okay. Does the church submit? Really quick thing. So far, William's doing the very good thing. And this is actually one good thing he does in a number of debates where um, even when his opponent is building up premises, which are obviously meant to be building up to a counter argument, um, when the when the premises themselves are actually uncontroversial, he doesn't do what many people do and just try to like, well, actually, technically, to be like the freaking nuance, bro. He, he and, and just dishonestly try to act like they disagree when they actually don't. The good thing with William, for the most part, except for one really bad time, which I do want to get to, um, he just grants all those premises. Even though he knows it's going to be built up into a counter argument, he's like, yep, I agree. Yep, yep, I agree. Great. And it's good. It shows confidence. Um, and it's just, genu it's just genuinely good. It doesn't waste time. Submit to the scriptures. Uh, define that. It depends what you mean. Does the church uh, submit to the scriptures? Yield, we believe yield that the to church authority. Okay, okay, this is it. I forgot I was actually right at the start, and this was not good. This is not good at all. So <laughs> let's, just, let's just rewind a bit. This is where it gets back. Note that question that that uh, that Theo gives. Does the church submit to the scriptures? Okay. Does the church submit to the scriptures? Uh, define that. It depends what you mean. Does the church uh, submit to the scriptures? Yield. We believe yield that the to church its authority. Yield to its authority. Mm -hmm. You'd have to break that down. I'm very confused with what you mean. If you mean, if you mean okay. that scripture stands above the teaching authority of the church, no, I do not agree with that at all. We're, we're told quite the opposite in, in, in the Bible, <clears throat> that the pillar and foundation of truth is the church. So that's, it, with all due respect, that, okay. that's a little bit so of a... This, a, a, a the right, so the church does not yield to the authority of scripture or does it? That's all I mean, yield. No, I don't mean the above, below. I, I simply mean yield no, the to the authority of the word of God. It does not yield to th the authority th of the word again, of God. There, again, there's your problem. You, you Notice what you did there. First you said, does the church yield to the scripture? Notice what you did. And then you switched it and you said, with your premise working with Sola Scriptura, does the church yield to the word of God? All day long, we can say that the church holds up the word of God, okay. but whether or not the church yields to scripture alone, there's a problem. The Bible doesn't teach the idea of scripture alone. So all day long, we can- Okay, so, so wow, a whole flurry of problems there. So, so Cram, uh, Theo's question wasn't, does the church submit to scripture alone? He, he didn't say, he just says, does it yield to scripture? Period, period. That's it. Um, and this is where- both in terms of substance, but especially in terms of optics, this section in particular is not good for William, where he cannot answer that very simple question, does the church yield to scripture? Because there is, there's, there's obviously ways in which Romanists officially have to say no, but there's ways in which you can say, yeah, it does. Because you can, you can see it in Roman teaching that scripture, it's, it's at least an acceptable position that scripture is that ultimate source of doctrinal teaching, including the churches. And so in that sense, yes, the church does yield to scripture. Although, of course, how that dynamic plays out is very different to Prots. So he could have just done what he did before and just said, yep, yep. And then once Cram, uh, Theo got to the more developed objection, then he would say, ah, 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 but you're presupposing this, you're assuming that, I don't grant those things. And he could have derailed it there against Theo. But he couldn't even accept that basic. Oh dear, that that is just that is not a good look at all. Not a good look. Um, and it just looks even worse where he explicitly says, um, he just straight up explicitly ends up saying, no, the church does not submit to scripture. Oh dear, oh dear. And yeah, yeah, great citation from the Council of Rome, which Roman Deuterocanon apologists love to cite all the time. Hey, look, this is our canon in the fourth century. 
Oh, but the scriptures on which the church is founded. And so ipso facto, in a way, there is some sense of the church yielding to the scriptures. Ruh, ruh, raggy, but in, in any case, it's not a good look for William. Not a good look. And that's what I kind of want to focus on here. On the right. Bible being the word of God, the scripture being the word of God, but the scripture alone is not the word of God. Right. So, but the church submits. Okay. I, I see what you're saying here, but the church submits. The church to is the, the pillar and foundation you, you of truth. Right, but the, the, the church, church does submit to the word of God, right? I, I would not use that terminology. I would use the terminology of the church being Ooh. the upholder, the preserver, and the pillar and foundation of the truth of the word of God, the preserver and the president of the word of God. The language in terms Oh dear. Oh dearie dearie me. Yeah, that's that 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 <laughs> Again, even putting substance to the side, that, that kind of fuels the very hardcore anti-Romanists. And even the more moderate ones, yet who still have these strong opinions, who just argue and are convinced that Rome just does not submit to the Bible, that just seals the deal for them a lot more. That is not good. Um, yeah, yeah, Pharisee moment. Big, big Pharisee moment indeed. Terminology that you're using, unfortunately, it's not apostolic terminology. Uh, okay. I mean, either the church submits to the word of God, or I think you just said it does, but you said that the word of God is not only in written form. So at this point, I just want to know right. if the, the church submits to right. the word I, of God, whether oral or so, written. Oral or written, does it submit? So me, does it yield to the authority of more, the word of God, or oral or written? Once, once more, the church relies on the word of God, but the church is but guided by the Holy to Spirit. As we, you're going to have to allow me to finish speaking. You have to allow me to finish my point. So the the, the church, the church recognizes the word of God. The church is guided by the Holy Spirit in all of her decisions. But the church, as we see in Acts 15, also gathers and discusses matters amongst themselves and is guided to all truth by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes Yeah, and they and they yielded also in part to the testimony of Holy Scripture in their decision. Uh... are not exclusively found within scripture alone but rather at times in That's history relevant. they can be found in apostolic tradition but we believe all apostolic tradition is handed down by christ yeah and, and if so and if so factor that it is the word of god too so do you yield to that or not <laughs> what what <laughs> comes from the apostles so we would even argue if we talk about the canon of scripture we believe christ god is the author of canon not the apostles so we would say again we wouldn't use the language of the church submitting to the scripture. We'd use the language of the church being the pillar and foundation of truth and the upholder of what the scripture is, whether written or oral. Okay. Uh, does the word of God or do the scriptures submit to the church? It, it has. It's a nonsensical question because the scriptures are not so, uh, a, an animate so thing. It, that can go and right. bow down so to the church. So and, that's a, and that is a fair point by William. Yeah, in, in terms of the precision of terminology, that's a, that's a fair point. Um, yeah, the scripture isn't an agent or a person that submits or whatever. So Theo, there's definitely better ways for Theo to have worded that. I, I think he does that here, but we'll, we'll see. Jesus, Question makes no sense. So let me give you an example. So when Jesus commands us to go and preach the gospel, does the church sure. yield to that commandment or is that nonsensical? The church upholds every teaching of Christ, but even the does gospel it yield to it. Though, does hold it on, yield, does, right? Okay, this so, is, okay. That, 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 that's the first real instance of of a big issue I have with Theo's um, rhetoric. Unfortunately, at this point onwards, he lets William just run all over him like roughshod a lot. He lets William interrupt him when Theo himself's trying to interrupt William, which he has the right to do because he's leading this cross exam. He has the right to interrupt him and continue the conversation. Um, unfortunately, Theo yields to William way too much. Um, and that was an excellent point he made there. So wait, does when Christ says in the word of God for the church to go out and preach the gospel, does the church yield to that or not? That's actually a really good illustration. If and, and and William, he tries to kind of like and he tries to nuance his way out of it, but it just doesn't look good. But unfortunately, William, by again, granted, by his serious riz, manages to take the reins of the conversation to a large extent, unfortunately. 
so the the way you're asking the <clears throat> questions, the way you're framing them, I've got to be very respectful. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The church obeys the Lord, and the church, Christ is the bride of the church. So the way you're setting up the question simply doesn't make any sense. You know, does the bride yield to Christ himself? The church follows all of the teachings of Christ because Christ is ahead. Preaching of the gospel is one particular thing, but even the gospel contains within it oral traditions that were passed down, written and oral. So there's a problem there when holding the Bible alone because even the gospel within it contains oral and written teachings. Okay, so the, the church obeys the Lord, yes? Christ is the head of the church. Well, there's a lot of irrelevance in there about, oh, but it has oral tradition. Well, if the Gospels contain oral tradition, then it's ipso facto written as what, yeah, whatever. Is that a yes? Christ, it's 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 a nonsensical question, brother. I I, I hate to break well, it. But you I don't just think said that the church obeys Catholic the Lord. Catholic ecclesiology. Right, but you Christ just said the is the head of the church. The so, right. right, so they obey the head. Well, hold the on. Head is, so let me, right. Okay, sorry. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead. So Christ is the head of the church. If we want to talk about the hierarchy, church members, do they obey Christ the head of the church? Without a doubt, of course. Does, right. Does the magisterium obey the Lord? The teaching authority of the church? <sighs> Miss, of yeah. Missed opportunity by the... I'm, I'm going to let it go for a little further because I don't remember this part. Um, I'm going to let it go a little bit further and hopefully he goes where I want him to go, but it doesn't look like he is, and I'm going to comment on that if he doesn't. Yes, and the Pope. Do they obey the Lord? Do they obey what the Lord says? Okay. Yep. He is good. 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 Yes. I, I'm. I'm confused how this is. What. What this has to do with Holy Scripture? It's about Scripture it's a alone. Oh. Okay, William, it's a cumulative case, bra. And I hope Theo says that. Pope it, it, or the Magisterium, right, right? Right. But I'm saying they obey what the Lord says. Do the Scriptures contain right. what the Lord says? Do Do the Scriptures contain yes. what the Lord says? What was that? Correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. Moving on. Are you able to hear Moving me? Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Can, can you hear Thank me? You. Thank okay. you. I don't mean to be so pointed. I don't mean to be so pointed. No, no. I, I'm just. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I'm not trying to be rude, brother. But I, I've yet yeah, to no receive problem. a single question on the thesis. Don't let him. Right. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll let the viewers decide if that that hit the thesis there. But let me move on here. No, that was okay. That was definitely not the way to do it. No, nah, no, nah, that was. He shouldn't have left to, well, I'm going to let the viewers decide. He should have said, well, no, this this is all relevant. I'm building a cumulative case here. And apparently you're having a hard time with this very, very weirdly and curiously of all the things for you to get held up on, the idea that the church yields to scripture. How is that wrong? Like you, you, you your, his, his case, William's case is scripture and tradition, not tradition alone not it's, and and it was very easy for theo to say he, he just about got there and he just about said it he didn't he, he didn't quite send it the full way through just the basic idea okay william you grant the church submits to christ and what christ says okay does scripture have does scripture contain what christ says yes and just to seal the deal is not scripture and not, not even the solar part not even the solar part yet but is scripture and ultimate uh authority on what god said yes therefore does not the church yield to scripture in some sense in some sense that's all that's why theo definitely should have gone more precisely he shouldn't have allowed william to walk all over him and and all that william would need to say is yes because then he could argue a bit later um on what precise sense that takes he would have been on much more solid ground there. But unfortunately, we have big big issues on both sides here. One with Theo allowing William to run over him like that and to get away with things. Um, and then and then also with William not actually, um, whatchamacallit, like refusing to grant a very basic premise that like at minimal, it looks bad optically in terms of, in terms of optics if he doesn't affirm it. I'm gonna let's go on a little bit more, and then I'm probably call the stream here because honestly, this is I, I'm I'm not kidding. This has actually made me tired just watching it again because this is basically how the whole debate goes on in the future. Oh dear. Okay. Uh, do you agree that public revelation ceased after the death of the last apostle? Absolutely. Good. Are the scriptures public revelation? Yes. Good. Okay. Public divine revelation. 
Right. Do you agree that the Pharisees sat in the seat of Moses? Yes, they did. But they, they, but rather than following the teachings that Moses handed down, they overstepped those boundaries and held to things that would have, as Irenaeus said, constituted watery traditions and they went against the word of God. Right. Okay, so, but you agree at least sat in the seat of Moses. Do you agree that the Roman Catholic Church sits in the seat of Peter? No. They don't occupy, that's no, not, that, their, that's not that, their center of authority, the seat of Peter? That, that's, a, that, that's a very, that's very odd distinct. question. St. Saint Peter, St. Saint Peter's seat is sat in by the vicar of Christ, by the Pope. We don't use the language and say that the Roman Church sits in the seat of Peter. We use the language of the Pope, the Vicar of Christ, because we only have one. Yeah, that was definitely imprecision on um, on Theo's part um, with the language there. Uh, and unfortunately, William capitalized on that to basically give a small lecture to show that, oh, he's, he doesn't really understand us. Um, I think, actually, I think that's exactly what he does here. Hang on. Reigning at a particular time that seats. And he is the, the it, and he is, and he is the, uh, the Bishop of the Roman Church, correct? He's the, le he he's the head of the church, right? The Vicar. As John Roman 21 church, says, right? as, as John 21 says, he is the shepherd of the whole church. He's the shepherd of the flock. And as Luke 22 okay. clearly tells us, he is the one that strengthens the brethren. He is the one that has the keys. Right. He is I got indeed you. the Pope. Yes. Right. So I, I think. No, Theo, no, 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 not gotcha. Not I gotcha. No, 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 no. That's a brilliant move by William. Great rhetorical move. Um, with pointing to, with pointing to, with trying to trying to say, well, what what is the position? How does the Roman Church work? Well, as the Gospel of John says, and as Luke says, Peter is the shepherd, and blah blah blah. Brilliant move of just drawing a seamless, incorrect, but rhetorically speaking, a seamless connection between what Rome believes in ecclesiology and what the Scriptures say about Peter. Great move, and a bad miss by Theo, unfortunately. Um, in just saying, right, right, right. No, 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 not right. He should have just immediately said, okay, not relevant to the debate, completely question begging. I don't grant that. So let's move on. He should have said that. He should have done that. But no, it's, uh, dear. Yeah, it's basically yeah, a lot of this. I think that's a yes and around it, just different semantics. Do you agree that the I don't Pharisees, think so. right? Well, don't let me interrupt. No, don't let me interrupt. Like, it's very confusing. Where is, right. Where is the yeah, Roman it's, church? It's confusing where is because. It's confusing okay. language because it 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 can it can attempt to lead people to believe that the other hierarchy, the other members, have an equal standing to the role of the pope. It's a confusing kind of question. It's one that, with all due right. respect, shows that you don't understand the doctrine of the papacy. Right. Oh, I'll, yeah. Okay. I'll let the uh, I'll let the, the listeners uh, determine. No, if not I, good. If I got that right. No, That's not problem. good. Okay. No. Again, another big slap by William there. That was a. That was just like, and I'm just, just a pure observational thing. I'm not saying, oh, how dare you, William? No, no, no. It's a debate. This is supposed to happen. But like, that was just straight up disrespect, like slap there by William. You, you don't, you, he, 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 John, Theo tried to say it's a semantics thing. Okay, fine. It's miswording, but we know what we're talking about. And William, William butted in, William butted in. And 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 I'm and I'm not even one to say, oh, how dare you? It's un it's ungentlemanly. How dare you do that? I mean, in some context, maybe, but in the end, a, th a, a debate, even if there's set rules, in the end, the only ultimate rule in debate is power. Um, who can actually exert their power and their will over a debate? And so, um, I, I can make character assessments about someone who breaks certain rules in a debate, but but in the end, ultimately, what matters is well, does it work or does it not? And in this case technically William should not have butted in because John Theo was moving on to his next question. He's the one in control here and William against the proper rules butted in, but it ultimately worked in the end, regardless of what he thinks proper, it worked because Theo just immediately silenced himself. He immediately submitted as soon as William was like, ah, but no, actually Theo was like, uh, uh, mm, uh right. Mm. Yeah. He, he, he just stopped. He's letting William control his own discussion. This is a big, big problem with this part of the, uh, with the of the cross exam. And not only did he let William butt in and just take the reins, he let William get away with that disrespect. You don't know what we're talking about. Theo 
at, at that point, that was bad enough. But he could have at least saved uh, some face with saying, and and, and and oh man, he could have at least saved some face with saying, um, well, no, that is exactly. I actually do know that was I was um I was um uh, I do actually know what you're talking about. I was just speaking in shorthand. And if you don't like that, then okay, I'm sorry that you feel that way. But let's move on because we know what we're both talking about. He should not have let William get on and finish that statement. You don't, I don't think you know what you're talking about because that, oh man, that was an assertion of power and William got away with it. That, uh, for the, for the, for the less informed in the debate, that was a great look for William. Yeah. On there. Do you agree that the Pharisees thought that their tradition was infallible? Uh, they thought that it was that it dated to ancient times, and they thought that it was godly. That's correct. Okay. I don't think they would have used the word that, infallible. That word doesn't appear in the Bible. Right, you're probably right. But they thought it was uh, it as binding as Torah. As Torah, uh, they, they thought that, that it was binding. They shouldn't have let them get away with that either, because even the even if it, it, it's, it's literally the that's literally the where is Jesus say I am God worship me me. Don't grant him that. Yeah, yeah, exactly, Athanasius. Yeah, don't, don't, don't grant him that. That's silly, because even if the word infallible is not in the Torah or the Bible or whatever, the concept is absolutely there. It is absolutely presupposed that whatever God says goes, and it's made clear, such as, for example, in the passage, uh, "Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God." Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God—that's the presupposition. Everything God says is true and brings life. Ergo, infallibility. So he should not have granted that. No, not at all. Authoritative. Right. On the level of Torah. Sure. Right. Okay. Do you agree that the Roman Catholic Church thinks their oral tradition is infallible? Or at least their sacred tradition? With... Yeah. According to 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, sacred tradition is the word of God as well. There, according there to 1 Thessalonians as well. And all over scripture. According to the Bible itself, the scriptura, yeah, oral oral teaching is the word of God as well. Okay. Did the Pharisees yeah, they, 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 there it happened again? There it happened again. Theo asks, does Rome believe X about itself? And then William replies, Yes, Rome does believe X because the Bible says this, drawing an immediate seamless equation between what Rome believes and what the Bible says. Brilliant rhetorically. And unfortunately, yet again, Theo lets him get away with it. He lets him get away with assuming the default position. Uh, great. I don't know if he's uh, if uh, actually he wouldn't be watching because actually William's about to have a debate with Father. Uh, actually, you know, what? I'm going to pull that up right now for people to follow because I'm going to be there. Um, error versus. Da, da, da. Um, sorry, no, no, it's 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 on it's on Albrecht's channel. Um, yeah, so debate coming up. I'll just lower this window for one second. Okay. So as you can see, debate coming up in 40 minutes. So I'm definitely going to finish before and then I'll probably finish in a few minutes, um, between Jonathan Prajean, who, uh, I think that's how you pronounce his name, um, who I've interacted with before and, um, no comment, but in any case with him and father James, um, Reformed Catholicism is not patristic. So that's the argument. Big debate. And it's on William's channel, Patristic Pillars. So he's going to be there. I'm going to be in the live chat. It's going to be very, very, it's going to be very spicy because me, uh, me and William, we've had our back and forth, um, bit, bit, bit heated and especially myself and Jono. Um, so that, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. I'm going to be in the, I'm definitely going to be in that live chat. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm going to jump in there like, hey, how's it going, boys? <laughs> um, but in any case, um, that's happening in 40 minutes. So people go on there, go to William Albrecht's channel and uh, yeah, prepare for that debate. So anyway, back here. Uh, I'll probably give this a few more minutes and then we'll finish it up. Reform Catholicism is basically the Reformation because the Reformation affirmed that we were of the church Catholic. We're not a new church. We are the same church from the apostles, but we're reformed. So that's what he's arguing. Um, I assume particularly Father James being Father James from an Anglican perspective. Claim their infallible tradition went all the way back to Moses. Yeah. Okay. Does the Roman Church claim their infallible tradition goes all the way back to the apostles? 
goes back to Christ, absolutely. Every single teaching okay. can be proven either. Hold on, hold on. Let, let me answer that. Uh, every, every single teaching can be proven from the word of God. Remember, the word of God is not limited to Bible only. But every teaching of ours, at least implicitly, I'd say 99% are either explicit or implicit in the scriptura itself. There are a few that would be that you would need outside testimony and tradition for, such as the canon of scripture. All right. So even though and, the Pharisees lets him get away with with question begging assertions. And so William's really taken it with this cross exam. She sat in the cathedra of Moses. Their oral tradition wasn't always correct, correct? That's correct, because they went against the commandment of God, we're told. The Lord tells us that they went against the commandment of God and they held to, not as two Thessalonians or any of these other passages tell us, they held to traditions of men. So there's a huge problem there. If you hold to traditions of men and elevate them above the word of God, you got a massive problem there. Right. When refuting the oral traditions of the Pharisees, did Jesus appeal to the scriptures as the final authority or did he appeal to some infallible oral tradition? He appealed to the word of the Lord. So there's a huge problem there because word of the Lord, when word of the Lord is utilized, it's never utilized to be confined to scripture alone. So as I pointed out in okay. my opening and rebuttal, hold on, hold on. I'm not done. I'm not done. Yeah, that, as yeah, I out, once again, rhetorical roughshod, rhetorical roughshod. Um, but this is a growing popular argument uh, from a number of their apologists. So I've seen it, especially from Trent Horn, where they'll say, well, linguistically, the word of the word of God actually doesn't ever refer to scripture. It refers to just the content itself. When I first heard that argument, I was like, my word, the level of dishonesty. Technically, that's correct. Technically, word of the Lord doesn't refer to this specific form of something being written down, the, the ink and the letters and the symbols and what have you. But that is extremely misleading um, because it does refer to the specific content that practically in history is only contained in written scripture. So in that derivative sense, yes, the word of the Lord when Christ uses it against the Pharisees, it is exclusively a written matter. That's where it is found exclusively. That's the point. That's the point of the argument. So it's, it's a very dishonest argument, but, but in any case, um, Theo's letting him get away with it. Sorry, my opening, I, re and I, re I know we have a tiny little lag, so I, I don't want to sound like I'm being rude or anything. But as I pointed out, this is very often quoted, but I'm, I, I want to emphasize again, it's not about sacred scripture against sacred tradition it's about bad traditions traditions of men making no and i mentioned this earlier what holy god etched in the tablets and handed on to moses on mount sinai and as dr brock the theologian and syriac scholar has pointed out that wasn't only confined to the scriptura okay well did you, when jesus rebukes the pharisees in mark 7 does he appeal to the written scripture or does he appeal to some oral tradition he, he appeals to the word of the Lord. I just answered it for you. And was, the word was, of the Lord is in, not in, confined in, in its written scripture form. Okay. I know, but broadly speaking, but in this okay, particular so passage, now. was he appealing to in the its written, written form? tradition? Yes. He's a, he's a No, he's not appealing to the written alone. He's appealing so when, to when, the word. When Catholic on, scholars, answer, like, I, I, I got to yeah, answer that. No, I think I don't let him know. Uh, when he refers to the word of the Lord, and I suggest you do a, a, a study on the word, word of the Lord. You can do a word study in the TLG, the Thesaurus Linger Gretchen. The word of the Lord is not only written, it was etched in stone on Mount Sinai. Mm. He's referring to that. That's why we're told that the commandments mm. are what is not what being held to. So the word of the Lord is written, etched on stone, and oral. So it's not referring to not a scripture that. passage please, alone. Yeah, it's referring to a commandment that is not being held. Please tell me you nail him on this. Where did they, it was one of the Ten Commandments, correct? And where do you find those Ten Commandments? At no, that time, where were they? No. Did they still have the stone tablets? Or were they written on a, on a scroll? You were, well, the stone tablets existed for a while. Uh, they existed for some time. And then it was preserved orally. And, uh, oh, man, the biggest, no, he, because... Theo was so close. He he was he was on that attack. Okay, whatever what you say about the word of the Lord, but where did Christ appeal to it? What source, what mode did he appeal to as containing that word of the Lord? 
written or oral. And, and William completely dodged it. He completely dodged it and went on another tangent. But unfortunately, Theo went along with that. Oh, just, oh God. He got, he got. Um, I think I, I think that basically, it's basically just a lot more of this for the rest of the debate, um, unfortunately. And, and even though there's more other particular things that we could address, um, in, uh, but because, because, yeah, that's actually what that's literally what Christ does. He appeals to Isaiah, a written text that is the word of the Lord. So William dodges that, but Theo gets let him get away with it, unfortunately. Um, yeah, it's mm, that, that's basically what the debate happens. There's, there's more particular stuff that happens later, of course, especially when the cross exam flips, but it's basically a lot more of that. And I don't have the time today to go through the whole thing because we're almost already at the two hour mark. Um, so yeah. Uh, that was this debate in some unfortunately people um in some theo's argument just in pure substance theo's argument was superior with respect to the opening at least um it was superiorly it, it was constructed in a superior manner it was more nuanced um it was very it was even very simple and elegant in its syllogism that's all that william needed to address that syllogism uh unfortunately williams he, william did not address that at all in his opening he wasn't prepared for that argument uh, he made a bunch of points which uh, Theo had completely uh, preempted really well. Unfortunately, uh, with the cross exams, that's where um, that's where things kind of started to fall apart quite a bit. Because again, even even with substance, Theo was still had the superiority, but he allowed William to take control of that um, and to capitalize on the smallest of errors and turn them into a mountain. Um, yeah, so that that was unfortunate. It's just another case study of. Uh, the power of rhetoric in these debates, how they can, how they can, um, even if one side is much better with substance, it can make them, uh, make them lose, lose it. Um, yeah, exactly. That's exactly, that's the perfect summary there. Cool Muso. Theo was far too gracious with William. I know people have different styles, but William isn't the type of person where this approach works. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. He needed to take the reins. Like, no, this is my cross exam. William, you're going to sit down. You're going to submit to me. You're going to, I'm your daddy in this, all right? In this cross-exam, I'm your daddy, all right? Listen to me. Listen to me. When I talk, you shut up. <laughs> That's what he should have done. That's what he should have done, but unfortunately, he didn't. Unfortunately, he didn't. Thank you very much, Steve-O. Oh, man, he's evol Steve-O's evolving. He's getting the lingo. He's evolving. Oh, no. <laughs> anyway, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. Uh, more awesome channel content coming on, including on uh, both on the blog and on the channel itself, including videos um become a supporter at locals down below and i uh, hope you have a lovely day or evening god bless